Welcome everyone. Um, it looks like it's a great turnout. Thank you very much for joining. Um, we're planning on hosting Lunch and Learns several times during the year of 2024. This is the first one this year. Thank you very much for joining. We will be covering various topics throughout the year. So I hope to see everyone for future topics. We will get this started. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much, Kathy Lennon. If you don't know Kathy, Kathy is our very own OFA general manager. Kathy joined the OFA in 2019. Prior to working for OFA, Kathy held positions with the Agriculture Adaptation Council, Ontario Sheep Farmers, AgriCorp, Farm Credit Canada, and Ontario Processing Vegetable Growers. She is a graduate of the University of Waterloo and the Advanced Agricultural Leadership Program. And while she is not a techie, she has developed a bit of a passion for the topic of cybersecurity and agriculture. So thank, with that being said, thank you very much, Kathy, for joining us today. Uh, I will pass it on over to you. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and a very special thank you to all of you that signed up to be here today. And also a very special shout out to the big team of people around me that helped uh, put this together from communicating uh, that we were holding this event today to all of the support that is behind the scenes um, to bring this webinar to you today. So you might be wondering, oh, hang on, I didn't press the right button to advance. We'll get this. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, you might be wondering if you are in the right place. And uh, I'm going to say if you have a phone or you have an iPad or a computer or a laptop, if you do online banking or if you have any kind of computerized equipment in your tractor or in your combine or in your barn, or if you have kids or employees that do any of those things, then you are in the right place. So I'm glad you're here. This is my dad. Uh, he is 74 years old. He was once upon a time a farm boy, and now he is a retired millwright. And why am I telling you this? Because my dad is the one who has uh, set up every smartphone that I've ever owned my entire life, uh, from my first BlackBerry to my most recent iPhone. He has helped me to uh, set up all of my personal laptops at home. And he's also the guy that taught me uh, that I needed to pay attention and care about bugs and viruses and cybersecurity. And so if you are not the person in your household that is going to help you with all of these things, um, hug the person that does, because honestly, uh, some people got to take care of this business. And in my personal life, it's my dad. So just wanted to give a shout out to him. He'd be proud of me here telling you about cybersecurity. Um, in this presentation today, there's going to be a few tips about uh, things that you can do at home to safeguard your IT assets. Um, and uh, I hope that you take a few things home today that you can do. So how did I get here in front of you today? As Joanne mentioned, I am not a cybersecurity expert. We do have a couple of members of our uh, OFA IT team here who might be able to answer some questions that would come up. But I would say this has sort of been an evolving continuum over my career. So uh, in my earliest days of working as general manager of Ontario Sheep Marketing Agency, uh, we talked about security from trespass. So humans, we talked about security from predators and uh, helping our members to understand what they could do on their farm in terms of fencing and livestock guardian dogs. Um, and over time that actually evolved into uh, helping farmers with biosecurity. And uh, once upon a time looking at um, things like foot and mouth disease and BSE and uh, swine flu and those sorts of things and bringing information and education home uh, to our members of things they could do. Um, and that could be, you know, implementing biosecurity at home, foot baths, teaching the government uh, about what kinds of things that uh, we needed to do at the airports to safeguard our farms. And, uh, and that over time now has just evolved into cybersecurity. So in some ways, this feels very natural. We have a, a new threat 
Um, it's something we can't see like a coyote or, uh, or even like a virus, but uh, still very similar. So kind of makes sense to be talking about this here today. So what is cybersecurity? I'm just gonna read this slide out loud. Cybersecurity is the practice of protecting critical systems and sensitive information from digital attacks, also known as IT security. Cybersecurity measures are designed to combat threats against your networked systems and applications, whether those threats originate from inside or outside the organization. Uh, wait, what a minute. Uh, inside the organization. In fact, they can come from inside the organization. Um, it can be a disgruntled employee, or it can of course be an activist or uh, someone that just takes pleasure in causing grief. I think a number of years ago, lots of people assumed cybersecurity risks originated from kids in their basements, uh, sort of doing it for entertainment. And now it's much bigger and, and people talk about um, these threats coming from um, organized crime. So the, the culprits are wide and varied. Uh, the good news is this has created new career opportunities. Uh, pretty exciting to share the news that they have a program at the University of Guelph now. Um, they've launched a one-year master's, one master's degree in cybersecurity um, and threat intelligence. So I think Joanne is going to throw the link in the, uh, in the chat box here so you can look into uh, more about that. There's an ever-growing list of career opportunities in, ag in agriculture. Um, and here's one, cybersecurity. And actually this month, they launched a $4 million state-of-the-art research and teaching innovation facility at the University of Guelph. So that's welcome that we have that right next door here. So why is this such a big deal? Uh, Canadian companies are paying nearly $7 million per incident in data breach costs. Uh, that's the third highest in the world. Um, according to the Canadian underwriter, August 2023 is where those stats come from, from the insurance industry. Healthcare, banking, and energy are often targets. You've probably seen news in your community of hospitals that have been hit um, banks, of course, are a, are a good target as well. And at the end of the day, while these might seem that, uh, that they are far away, they impact us directly because those costs have to be passed on to the consumer. Uh, that means you and I are paying um, for these breaches. How can it possibly cost that much, $7 million per incident uh, for these data breaches? It is downtime for companies. It's lost revenue, lost sales. Sometimes it's ransom paid. And uh, there's also an issue of lost consumer confidence. So just taking a look at some uh, financial statements across the country in the past year, the retail chain uh, Empire, which owns Sobeys and Safeway, uh, they report on their financial statements in black and white, $25 million was lost this year in a cyber attack. Um, JBS, which is the world's largest meat processor, they report uh, in their financial statements they paid over $13 million Canadian to get their systems and data back up and running after a cyber attack. Uh, Maple Leaf on their financial statements report $23 million in losses to cyber attack. Um, so while we're all sensitive to issues around food inflation, um, you can see that these are costs that those companies um, in the food sector are going to have to pass on to consumers. Um, and, and all of those numbers, those are cash costs out the door for those companies. That doesn't take into consideration their lost business time, uh, lost revenue or reputation. Um, MasterCard actually reports that only 39% of Canadian businesses in their estimation are implementing adequate uh, safeguards in terms of cybersecurity. And uh, cybercrime has also increased by 600% since the pandemic. Um, and in some cases, they point to remote work re resulting in 238% rise in cyber attacks. So it is growing. So what does a cyber attack in agriculture look like? Um, you can't see it. You know, it's not as obvious as... Uh, as Voldemort or someone right at your computer screen, it happens behind the scenes and you don't see it. So it can often come in the form of phishing, uh, which is phishing is just a crazy way of saying someone pretending to be someone else. 
So Paul Nairn, one of our coworkers here at OFA, he might be on the call here today. This is an actual text that I received. Uh, this is Paul Nairn, are you available at the moment? And I replied yes, because at that point it, it didn't seem unusual. So I started a conversation with someone um, and then the next message that came, uh, you can see on the screen here, I'm in a conference right now. That's why I'm contacting you through here. I should have called you, but the phone is not allowed and it went on. So because the spelling was kind of poor and the grammar and the wording was not something that Paul would say, um, I knew right away. And so the conversation stopped at this point and I blocked this person um, from my phone. But one of the concerns I think that we need to be aware of is that AI, artificial intelligence, um, will start to make these conversations that we have with fraudsters um, more real. They're going to be able to mimic and copy and communicate with us even better than they do today. So um, phishing is one of the common ways that people engage us in a conversation and collect information from us. So that's a real one that happens. Um, you may also see these kinds of things on Facebook if you're a user. Um, attackers rely on human error and phishing and stolen credentials are, are as I said, most, most common. Another one, uh, stolen credentials. Uh, I, this is an example of a letter that I received in the mail just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, darn. And then when I looked at it a second time, I thought, oh, great. I can use this and as an example of, uh, of a cybersecurity incident in my presentation. So I insure my home and my car through Air Farmers Mutual, and they have advised their customers recently um, that they've had a data security incident, a cyber attack, and my name, address, phone number, um, and my driver's license has been um, stolen. And uh, we don't actually yet know what the implications of that will be. Someone might use it to apply for credit. Um, they might use it to impersonate me, to gather information from others. And um, so these are, these are things that are happening every day. Things, the other things that I've seen here at OFA is emails from suppliers or vendors, and uh, it's a fake invoice or a fake contract, and they are relying on me to fall for it and click on that attachment or that link in the email to a, to a false statement or an invoice. And you're probably receiving these things too. So what happens next once they have this information um, once they have data or you've clicked on the link, uh, what you might see is they start to take remote control of your operating systems, uh, freeze you out of your computer or a particular program. Uh, they may hold your information or your data or your contact information for ransom and seek payment from you. That's uh, increasingly common for sure. Uh, sometimes there's threats to release your information uh, to an, to the internet, uh, so that just becomes public or to a particular organization. Um, or as I said, maybe they use this information to pose as you or your business or your organization um, and to trick and scam others. So why do people do this? Um, sometimes it's money driven. Uh, there's an ask for cash to release your technology back to you. Sometimes it's power and intimidation. And I'm gonna talk about a specific incident here in Ontario uh, where they weren't looking for money, they were just looking for power and control. Uh, sometimes it's uh, the intention is just to disrupt or control something. Uh, so they say approximately one third of cases now are originating from Russia, China, India, or North Korea. I think I read in the paper this morning that uh, the government of Canada has an incident currently um, and they are thinking that the uh, cybersecurity breach originated from Russia and uh, lots of talk about uh, interference in elections and those sorts of things. And also sometimes it's just driven by um, a desire to get the data that you have or the information that you have. Uh, we've got a lot of great innovation and technology here in Canada, particularly in agriculture. People may be interested to know more about the technologies, innovation or trade secrets, which are contained in our computers. Regrettably, um, 
I've seen a lot of these uh, examples here in, uh, in Ontario, and I want to hit a little bit closer to home here. Um, we're not just talking about getting locked out of Facebook or your email or even online banking, all of which would be terrible, of course. But in agriculture, we are more and more reliant on technology uh, every day. And it could be in the barn, your heating, cooling, environmental systems, watering. It could be related to your GPS systems um, or, or a robotic milking um, barn, which is collecting a lot of information. And just imagine uh, sort of the impacts on your farm if that is interrupted for a day or a week or a month, um, the kind of uh, impact it would have on your farm. Just need to catch up my notes to my mouth here. I'm talking faster than my paperwork. All right. So three cases that lit my fire for this topic. Uh, Joanne mentioned in my introduction that uh, I kind of had developed a passion for cybersecurity. And uh, these are the three cases that really hit home for me in Ontario. Uh, so one is a crop input retailer here in Ontario. Lots of locations, probably a location near you. Um, Agrimart and Solio had a breach in there, um, and all of these things are reported in the paper, so I'm not sharing any tales out of school, but uh, someone broke into their systems, their accounting systems, and took customer information, uh, names, address, phone numbers, credit card numbers in some cases, as well as uh, cropping information and uh, personal farm information, and uh, threatened to release that information to the dark web, where it would be public uh, and available for, for use um, by those who obviously don't have good intentions. And a uh, terrible, terrible situation they're faced with. Um, and in fact, it's not over. While this case is two years old, um, that company is still facing long-term impacts because there is a class action lawsuit um, that they're involved in from the concerns uh, that sort of evolved out of that situation. Um, another personal one um, that I'm aware of is a hog farm here in Ontario. I referred to earlier, there was a situation where it was control uh, that the activist was looking for as opposed to ransom. Uh, so there was a hog farm here in Ontario where someone indicated uh, that they had broken in um, through the farm's own security cameras and they had access to video footage um, from that farm of a situation of animal abuse. And the attackers didn't ask for money, they asked for a false confession. And um, something sort of unique that we hadn't seen very frequently in a number of these cases. And I can't imagine the uh, mental anguish and turmoil and stress for that family um, and that farming operation. They were able to resolve it fairly quickly, I understand, um, and determined that the, uh, the attackers, of course, did not have any video footage uh, to release to the public, but they had taken control of the computer system, so it did appear as though it was possible. And the last one, of course, that hit pretty hard um, that we really started to pay attention to and, and decide that we needed to do more work with our own members um, and help to raise the bar on cybersecurity awareness is uh, our sister organization in Quebec, the UPA. So they're like the OFA of Quebec. Um, they were subject to a cybersecurity attack, I think it was last summer, and their member information and employee information um, was taken for ransom, and uh, their systems, I think, were shut down for at least a month. They were basically paralyzed um, and had to rebuild all of their organization data and accounting and systems and website from scratch. So a tremendous pain and expense for that organization and uh, with those three cases combined, um, is kind of where I said we need to do more about this. So I did already talk a little bit about um, cybersecurity and why it matters. Uh, the agriculture sector, the University of Guelph has done some great work. There are some excellent professionals uh, next door here in Guelph, um, really paying attention to cybersecurity in agriculture and the food industry. And uh, they've done some research which demonstrates that the agriculture sector is lagging behind other sectors in terms of readiness and implementation implementation of cybersecurity standards. And again, honestly, that's why I'm here. Um, I really want to I really want to take some of the fear out of uh, cybersecurity discussion and show people that average everyday people 
like you and like me can do a few things to safeguard our information, whether it's in your home or in your business or in an organization like um, OFA. In my mind, it's uh, it's actually not a matter of if we experience a, uh, a cybersecurity breach, it's really a matter of when it happens and how prepared for it you were and how bad it is. Um, as I said, the work of trespass and security hasn't gone away on the farm and that work of raising awareness and implementing biosecurity protocols to protect her health herd, herd health and flock health um, is still there. And this is just one more thing we're going to have to put on the to-do list. So here's one of the biggest risks uh, that they've identified in agriculture is uh, organizations are running on older and outdated software, and that's a juicy target for ransomware. So while this uh, quote is about organizations, I know it's true at home and on the farm as well, we're all probably guilty of uh, making do with equipment or software and programs that are out of date but they still seem to be doing the job. So we haven't prioritized the upgrades or the patches or the transitions to the latest and greatest that are available. And uh, this is one of the things, one of the easy things that we can do to improve our cybersecurity uh, measures is uh, don't press later. You know, when you get a legitimate uh, message from Microsoft or um, Apple, which says there is an update that is available uh, for the programs that are important to you or your business, take the upgrade when it's available. Uh, because a lot of the times they've actually identified as a company that there is a weakness um, or a spot that, that needs to be patched uh, right away. So stay current with software and systems that are critical. Um, the other thing you can just do is take a look uh, make a list of all of the places in your home, on your farm, in your business where, um, you know, Wi-Fi, the internet, uh, your systems are really critical and, and sort of identify what those are and uh, where you're at in your upgrade status. Make a plan. So I talked a little bit about phishing earlier, but sort of there's three different uh, words that are often thrown around when you're researching cybersecurity on the internet. Phishing is those scammer emails uh, that we are seeing a lot more of. Vishing is scammer phone calls. So you often hear about, um, you know, someone got the grandparent call. I think I read about one of those on the uh, in the newspaper this morning. Um, someone gets a call from an urgent grandchild that has been arrested. Um, they are sitting in the local Fergus Police Department and they need their grandparent to quietly uh, transfer some money uh, to get them out of trouble without telling the parents. Um, and uh, I'm very unfortunately, I've, I've heard of some people in Wellington County, my, uh, my home community, that have uh, been victim of one of these scammer phone calls. And uh, smishing is scammer text messages. So that message that I got from uh, Paul Nairn earlier that is smishing. Um, I put this on here because I think some of the lingo that is used in um, cybersecurity language and by some techie people, it can become a little bit intimidating, um, but really in, in all cases, it's just a scammer um, behind all of that. And it doesn't matter that you know the right words um, to use. So in addition to taking the updates and making sure that your software is up to date, what else can you do? Um, I really can't stress enough the importance of password protecting, uh, using unique, pack, unique passwords, um, unique user logins for your various different programs. Um, I for sure used to be one that had the same username and the same uh, password uh, that I was using in many, many, many sites. And uh, because it was easy to remember. So I know why people do it. And more and more, um, what happens is your username and your password that you use everywhere um, is subject to a breach. And then that person then has access to get into your systems in many, many places. Um, so I'll give an example of one that I'm aware of. I know of an individual that uh, went for a vacation to Las Vegas. Uh, they registered for their hotel room at uh, MGM, MGM, the hotel. Uh, so they had their name their email address and a password associated with it at MGM. Uh, there was a, 
a breach in MGM system. And now that individual's name, address, and password that they use everywhere is on the internet and it's available for anyone to use. And they can log into potentially your CIBC account, your farm credit account, um, various different places. So the reason it's important to have unique usernames and passwords is because if they are leaked to the internet, it just gives people so much more opportunity um, to get inside your important uh, programs and systems. Use of two-factor authentication. Um, it's not something I see that we are doing a lot in our own homes and businesses, uh, but definitely you see a whole lot more of that um, in government practices. So um, if you are logging into a CRA site, you might put in a, a username and a password, and then they send you a text message um, to say, okay, now you need to put in this code in addition to your username and password uh, to confirm and authenticate that it is you as a user. So that's becoming more and more common. Two-factor authentication is just making sure that you're relying on something in addition to that username and password. Um, the other thing that can be super helpful um, is email filters. Uh, you may have this at home. I know a lot of businesses do. Um, they set up filters to try to reduce the risk of these emails getting into your inbox. Um, so it prevents prevents spam uh, from reaching your employee inboxes or your inboxes for that matter. Um, sometimes good emails get sifted out. Um, that definitely is a risk. Every now and then someone says, I sent you an email and uh, I search and search and I can't find anything and it might have been filtered out for some reason. Um, but on the bright side, we do filter a lot of emails out before they ever get um, into the hands of, um, of the user at the end. Um, I think I've covered everything on that slide. Um, in terms of managing passwords, uh, understanding that it is a huge pain to have unique usernames and passwords everywhere you go. Um, we need to find a good way to keep track of all of these passwords. Um, so we have a couple of examples here that, that might be useful for you at home. Um, so a password manager, so you only have to remember one username and one password, and then that gets you into sort of a lockbox of, of a place that you can safely store all of your passwords. Um, Bitwarden is one of those possible password managers, or 1Password um, is another option for a password manager. Um, it's best to have them in a place, uh, not in a sticky note on your computer monitor, um, but there's lots of different places that you can keep them in your home, um, on the inside of a book or something uh, that you can grab when needed, but it's not visibly out in the open. The important thing is don't use the same password for everything. And, um, you know, don't use obvious things like your birthday or your hometown or your first pet's name. Um, something that's really easy for people to figure out. Oh, I'm behind again. Um, all right, vulnerabilities in agriculture specifically. Um, I think that one of the things that has been identified is that uh, we've had a little bit of a lenient approach uh, in terms of who has access to on-farm systems, uh, such as sharing passwords or using a single login for all users, and even sometimes not removing system access for employees who no longer work for the business. Um, which can leave a business vulnerable. So um, very important that everyone has their own username and their own password and that you keep up to date with those sorts of things, you know, um, closing off those accounts when someone leaves, not just because that person um, may have uh, Ill, Ill intent. It can be because, as I said, we find situations where someone's username and password has been used outside of the farm. You know, they were registering uh, to attend an event and that's where the data was compromised. Um, so if those usernames and passwords are out of your system, you're protected from um, any potential breach that may have happened. And then uh, lack of awareness. A lot of people just actually uh, don't know what the risks are. Um, I think we see a lot of situations where, um, you know, a new employee or, you know, in, in many cases, an older person that may not be aware of some of these risks um, is, is more vulnerable uh, than others. So training is something that is uh, 
is very highly recommended. The Government of Canada actually has a, I'll put, I think it's on my next uh, slide here. Yeah, the Government of Canada actually has some pretty decent free e-learning available um, that is designed specifically to support small and medium-sized businesses and organizations uh, to obtain a cyber secure uh, certification and improve your cybersecurity knowledge. So there's lots of training out there. There's lots of companies out there um, that are willing to support you. Um, I just highlight this one because uh, it's free, but certainly don't hesitate to, uh, to identify other opportunities for your employees. And I think the other thing that is really important to keep in mind is it's not once and done. Um, we here at OFA, we've been uh, training our employees on a fairly regular schedule. And uh, we've got some things scheduled again um, coming up in the next month or so, because as we get better prepared um, and uh, more secure, obviously the hackers are improving uh, at the same pace, right? So we got to stay ahead of them and their tricks and tools and keep it up. All right. And so I think I did already talk about this one a little bit already on an earlier side, but uh, slide, but another vulnerability in agriculture specifically identified in this research is that we have some outdated programs and systems running um, that are no longer being updated. And it's one of the most common vulnerabilities. Uh, research shows that the last so software update in 90% of farming systems was years ago. Um, so definitely something to pay attention to and, uh, lack of backups. So I actually spoke about cybersecurity in November at, uh, an annual meeting of Saskatchewan pork and talked to a number of people at that conference about, uh, at the farm level, data backup is not happening as frequently as it should. Um, I talked to a couple people who indicated, uh, they do it once a year when they do their, um, taxes and sort of a lot of organization office book work, they do a, um, a backup. And I know here in the OFA, I am devastated if I lose one hour's worth of work um, and have to redo it if it got interrupted some way. So I can't imagine um, rebuilding a year's worth of uh, data or accounting or uh, farm records. So um, you need to sort of take a look at what you're doing in your systems on a regular basis and determine what is a reasonable and practical uh, backup schedule. Um, it's not just good for a uh, cybersecurity breach. Of course, it can just be um, a program or server failure. And uh, so pay attention to backups. Uh, backup strategies. I've just outlined uh, a couple of things here. Um, you can back up your computer to external hard drives. Um, in some cases, uh, folks are using third parties. Uh, so you can hire someone out to be responsible for your um, backups so that you don't have to do it and um, have a plan and schedule your backups to stay ahead of things so that you don't forget. And it's also a good way to keep track of your versions um, in case you need to restore. There are lots of options out there in the marketplace so for cybersecurity software of your choice. I think some of the popular names that are out there that you might recognize, um, Norton has been around for a long time. McAfee is another one that does uh, sort of security software updates, uh, monitors personal and small business computers. Um, at OFA, we use one called Cato, uh, which is cloud-based security. Um, but similar to other programs, uh, once you get a cybersecurity software, um, you too need to keep updating it as well. And so it, it's a business expense for sure uh, to buy those programs. But uh, every day that you avoid an outbreak on your farm or uh, outbreak in your computer system, I think that uh, that subscription for a cybersecurity software is worth it. So just in terms of uh, at home and on the farm, um, you know, take a systems-based approach to doing an inventory on your own farm. Everyone needs to do it themselves. Identify what your most important assets are on the farm, including your systems and programs and data, and then take action to protect those assets. Um, you know, not a whole lot different than fire insurance or, uh, or proper fencing. We need to look at the cybersecurity in a different way. Um, we need to de detect and identify breaches and attacks and then respond appropriately to these attacks. 
and recover and clean up. As I mentioned, um, you know, I'm not always sure that it's it's something that can be prevented forever. Maybe it's a matter of when and not if. Um, every one of us is subject to one of these situations, but uh, if we have a plan in place, um, it will make the, re the response time and recovery um, even easier. Cybersecurity checklist. So uh, an easy checklist for adopting cybersecurity best practices. Uh, make a checklist of all your current technology. Ensure you're using uh, current software versions and systems. Um, don't share your passwords um, and ensure they're strong, that they're not simple passwords. Um, establish basic rules for your team. That's really, really, really important. There's lots of people working probably with you um, on your farm and in your business or in your organization. I'm not sure who's all on the call here today, um, but make sure that your full team has a good understanding of the, of the threats that are out there and to have the best practices um, for training and uh, and don't click on links. Sometimes it's as simple as, you know, if in doubt, press delete. Uh, and many, many times that's actually the, the quickest and fastest way to move on. Backup and uh, ensure new systems and devices are set up properly. Uh, ask your suppliers that are coming in with equipment to your farm or your barn or your business, um, what security uh, and devices they have already put into place with what you're having installed at your farm and whether the data is encrypted. All right, and this is my last slide. Uh, so a lot of it is going to be repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, but I, what I want you to remember when you hang up from this uh, call today is uh, best practices for passwords and storing them carefully. It is a pain to have unique usernames and passwords for all of the programs that you have. Um, but it's probably the biggest uh, practice that you could take away from this call today and implement at home to improve your cybersecurity. Err on the side of caution with texts or emails or website links you're not sure of. Um, it's always best to double check if you have any inkling that what you're looking at doesn't really make sense. Um, don't do it. Uh, check it out before you proceed. Back up, back up, back up. Um, do the updates and uh, take it seriously. So I think that uh, is my last slide. And uh, Joanne, I'm ready for any questions that people might have. Great, that was a, a lot of information. That was wonderful. Um, so I'm just looking at the chat here. Um, some of the questions in the chat came in and um, it was kind of before you answered, but I will go through some of them again. Um, sure. How good is the antivirus software at preventing hackers? Is there so a... I think, go ahead. yeah, so I think my, uh, I will open it up certainly for some of my colleagues that are on the phone that have more IT uh, knowledge than I might, but it, I think it's important to have those cybersecurity programs uh, that I had in place, but it, it's it's imperative that you keep them up to date as well regularly. Um, so you buy the subscription for the antivirus software, and then you know it 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 needs to keep being updated um, in order for it to continue to be successful. Uh, because the hackers and the scammers and whatever all the right words are for these folks, they get better too, and they figure out how to get around the walls and how to find the weak spots. So it's it's never a once and done, but they're worth having. Okay. Um, the other one that's in here, again, I think you did have this within the content of your um, presentation, but how safe are the passwords that get Google or Apple generate to save on devices? Oh, that's a good one that I don't know the answer to. Um, I don't know if one of my colleagues would want to make a comment on that. I certainly have started to personally uh, to use those uh those passwords when they have been recommended to me, they're very long, very complicated, and I, I won't remember them, but I have personally put some trust in that. Matt did say he'd jump in here, so go Perfect. ahead. Thanks, Matt. Hi, um, so it's a very finicky answer to give on this one. The purpose of those ones is they are random, and random is good, random is harder for it to detect. But the issue is, you're still saving it to an open source. When you do with Google, you usually says, hey, do you want a random password? Do you want to save that random password to 
the browser, which is then and now exposing your scene. So it's one of those hit and miss kind of concepts where it's random is excellent and it's giving you ideas of stronger password options, but then to protect yourself, you still want to do that where you either saving it offline or choosing not to save it to your thing. I know some people say write it down on paper or notebooks to help themselves. The reason why Kathy suggested something like a Bitwarden or a 1Password is then you make one personally strong password that you have to protect. And then all the websites can have those random passwords um, that you don't need to save anymore because all you need to remember is your one strong password and then the random passwords follow through with the sites. And if for whatever reason, one of those sites does get taken down or uh, um, interrupted with, you're not losing any of your core passwords. You're only losing a random one that you have no tie to. Thank you, Matt. Um, I did pop the two links um, in the chat earlier, so you can refer back to them. And those are um, to help um, with passwords, so to store the passwords. Um, which is the next question, what is the best way to store passwords, which was already answered. Are there any, is there anyone um, that has a question that just wants to raise their hand? Uh, I know I'm jumping in again here just because I can't see some of the questions in the chat. Um, so in order, I'll just answer the ones I see. Um, how vulnerable are the password programs against data breach themselves? There is always a chance that they can be taken. Um, there is one out there called LastPass that has been compromised once and only once. Um, and they are the only one that has made an announcement to date of ever being compromised. Um, in the setup process, when you create an account, there are some, even that has a two-factor itself, which you have to download a specific document that protects you as a core. So because those aren't your passwords that you worry about, they may know um, the password combinations that you've set up, but they don't have access to you as a core account. Now, as I said, the one that came out, which was LastPass, um, the only information that got pulled from their system was only actually just the names of the people, not the actual password combinations. But it's one of those things where um, anything has a chance of being compromised. It, it's not just only agriculture, it's everything in the world. So it is a pro and con. The chance is you have a higher chance with a security company to, to secure your system than just a generic sticky note on your desk or Google open source like that. So it's take it as a grain of salt. It is better for you, but there is still a chance that something could happen. Um, I see. There's another question here. Um, can you discuss the pros and cons of facial recognition? Sure. Um, Face recognition and even thumbprints are good additional options. I personally use it myself, but you have to understand that with passwords, the same thing, there's always a chance that I'm going wrong. Now, I've tested it with different phones and some are better than others, but if someone picks up your phone and just angles it towards you, it can unlock. So if you're in your own personal life, you, you just started your own, you're keeping it solo, there's no real concern, it's easy for you to use and functionality wise. But if you're out in public and say you put your phone down, if someone picks up your phone, swings it in front of your face, there is a chance they've just unlocked your phone. So once again, it's a good alternative to a password to make your life easier to, to use your devices, but there is a chance that it can be used against you. All right, thank you. Um, another question here is, can you share examples of hacking of milking robots, GPS software, or other egg-specific technologies? What are the problems or outcomes? We gain about an hour and 14 minutes from the beginning of the month, and we look at the largest snow you know. Thanks to who's ever looking after our, uh, our uh, microphones in the background. Um, so I can answer... Um, 
in terms of a couple of examples that have been shared here in Ontario around uh, farm information that can be utilized. Um, so there's two situations uh, here in Ontario where um, a chicken farm uh, experienced a cyber attack or a poultry farm, I guess I don't know for sure it was chickens. Uh, for sure poultry farms uh, that were attacked and uh, someone got into their uh, systems in the barn controlling heating, cooling, air conditioning, possibly watering and feeding, and they demanded uh, ransom in order to return control to the farm of those operations. So give me $50,000 or I turn the heat up on your farm uh, and your poultry will, you know, die. So um, immediately, you know, causing people a tremendous amount of grief and concern puts them in a in a weak position to play the game with the hacker. Do they do they really have the ability to do that? Will they really do it? Do I pay the money? Do I unlock my systems? You know, turn them all off. What are the implications of doing that? Um, so those are some very real examples. Could it happen on a dairy farm as well? I I personally believe it could. Um, I'm not a dairy farmer, but I understand that uh, for folks that have uh, robotic systems, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is happening there that is automated on the farm where you're segregating potentially, you know, if a cow has been treated and uh, they are, uh, the system is going to keep their milk out of the batch. Um, if someone says, hey, you know, I have now taken control of your computer system and your data and I can, you know, stop that from happening or, um, you know, compromise this week's load of milk. So those things can happen when someone can take remote control of your system, whether it's feed or water or milking or heating and cooling, um, it's a risk. So that's that's my answer on that. On, on the GPS thing as well. Uh, you know, could they play with uh, your systems, your records, just make things very difficult for you and ask for money to say, okay, um, you know, I have now um, taken all of your farm data, I've manipulated it, it's now no longer no longer accurate. Uh, for record keeping, you need to provide to your processor or suppliers, you know, about what you did apply or did not apply when, um, you know, if that data is out there and it's on the internet, very regrettably, someone can use it for, for, for evil. I hope that answers the question. And I don't want to be a fear monger. I just want to be clear. I, I have no, uh, I hope no one, no one hangs up from this call today uh, being afraid. Um, but I think we do need to take this very seriously. You know, why would someone hack into uh, JBS? and uh, you know, and want their data and their information for control. Um, you know, they messed up the ability not just for that processing plant, but there was a significant number number of uh, of livestock farmers in in all of North America that were unable to ship their cattle uh, to be processed. And uh, until JBS came up with thirteen million dollars and said, "Please give us our our systems and our data back so that we can get back to business." Okay, another question here is any concerns with online bookkeeping programs or similar accounting relating related programs? I think it's reality um, that what we are are doing these days is is a lot of online stuff, whether that is online banking, online accounting, um, online filing of your taxes. Um, I don't think it's something that we're going to stop. But that's why if, if those are the ways we are going to conduct our business, um, that's why it's important that we take all of the measures that we can to keep that information safe. Um, and so with your accounting software that you're using um, that is web-based or cloud-based, it's important to make sure that you're using the most recent versions that are available, um, that you've accepted the patches or the updates as they've come along, and that when you log into that accounting software, you have a unique username and password. Um, potentially, you have a, a strategy of updating or changing that password if necessary to make sure that you've done everything that you can do to keep that information and data integrity and, and keep it safe. So I don't think that the days um, are, are going to change of, of doing business that way. Um, it's important. It's efficient. 
Um, it, it allows us to manipulate and use that information and data for good reasons, um, but we have to take the appropriate precaution. Okay, um, another question is worst case scenario, a data breach occurs and you experience some kind of loss. How current are most insurance policies with this kind of damage? Can you get coverage for cyber attacks? So yes, I would say cybersecurity insurance is a relatively new um, industry. We do have a policy here at OFA um, in terms of, uh, of that sort of thing. Um, I don't think that it is widely available. I did a little bit of research uh, before I went in and gave this presentation at an earlier meeting about what is available to individuals on the farm in terms of cybersecurity insurance. Um, and I, I don't think there's a well-developed de market yet. Um, and I think the insurance industry is trying to figure that out. How can they develop a product? What will be covered? What will the terms and conditions of that, uh, of that policy be? You know, how will they know that you have done everything you can do on the farm to manage the risk? And then the, there's just such huge variation in terms of those those numbers that I threw around earlier about, you know, for some of the large businesses, so we're not talking about farms, but um, tremendous loss. Um, the Canadian underwriters are saying in Canada, the average security breach uh, cost was $7 million. I think in the US, it was around 9 million. Um, and the Middle East, I think it was a little bit higher than that. But the cost um, is so great. So I, I believe this is an area the insurance sector is going to have to um, pencil out and figure out how to make this affordable and, and realistic as well. Okay, another question on here is what considerations should be used when internet browsers or smartphones or similar systems have saved, so have saved passwords for future access and personal information like payment cards or auto filling when filling in forms, especially for operations that have multiple devices synced? I think Matt kind of answered that um, a little bit earlier, just about, you know, there's pros and cons to doing that. So the information that you are allowing Google, for instance, to save, um, whether that's for filling out forms or for your credit cards, um, the information is somewhat secure. Um, but of course, there's a greater risk than having you enter and submit that information each time and not allowing your system to save it. So it's not perfect, that's for sure. Is that it, Joanne? Oh, Diana's got her hand up. Hi, so I'm just going to build off a, a statement in the in the chat. Oh, I would. Um, pardon? Go ahead, nope, Diana. Go right ahead, sorry. Okay, sorry. About um, checking with sales and supply companies you're working with for data robotics, et cetera, and what their data protection protocols are. How can you, A, ensure that they are actually maintaining their protocols and and how does the industry influence those um, egg suppliers to be aware and and uh, stay on top of these situations so that you don't get a breach through them? It's a great question, Diana. And um, I think as we all start as a as a food and farming sector. Uh, to look at this more carefully. I think that those are conversations that we need to have, you know, throughout the whole chain. Um, you know, what's happening at the farm, what's happening with those suppliers, what's happening at processing, what's happening at retail, um, because the impact is, is so huge. And so how can you, I mean, I think it will be a big start to just start to have those conversations. I mean, it'll be a big step just to start to have those conversations about, hey, supplier X, um, what information do you have about me? How are you storing it? Uh, how are you safeguarding it? Um, and, and raise that awareness and work on it together. And we'll, we'll get there. You know, we're, we're doing it in, it, going back to my first point where I 
the more I've thought about cybersecurity, the more I've thought about it in, in the other things that we've tackled that were very similar to this, right? When we first as an industry, when I was at Ontario Sheep, started taking very um, significant look at okay. biosecurity on the farm. It was something that, you know, the pork industry was way ahead. Um, they had been doing lots of things on the farm that some of the other livestock sectors um, didn't have in place. And so we started having those discussions about what about the people that provide the feed uh, to the farm? Or what about the people that are going in and out of the milk house? And what are the expectations that we have of someone coming on and off my farm? So it might be plastic booties. It might be, you know, they've properly cleaned and rinsed their vehicle. Um, we, we understood that as a farm, we can only do so much to protect our livestock or our poultry um, and our suppliers have to do the same. And so I think we all learned together um, that we'll all, we're all part of this. And I think those same practices need to happen or those same discussions and best practices need to happen in cybersecurity. So we're only one piece of it and everyone has a role. Okay, so there's one more question and we will be finished with this. I think it kind of links with the last one, but how can we secure our email information from lawyers and accountants? Is there a program that will encrypt and protect our legal information that we receive over emails? I'm going to see if Matt maybe has a uh, has an answer for that. I know for me personally, when I get information from my accountant uh, or my um, well, lawyer, I don't really have a lot of that. But um, when I get my taxes back, for instance, by email, I save the email to my computer. So my personal computer at home, and then I delete the email. Um, but I guess if someone hacked into my computer and, and got into it, maybe it doesn't help. So Matt, you have a better answer than I do. I mean, your answer kind of answered what I was going to say. Um, all email systems do actually have encryption. So from the point of it, leaving your computer, going to theirs and vice versa, it is encrypted. But the problem is when people are hacking things like this and trying to get that information, they're not trying to get the middle ground, they're trying to get the end piece. So if the lawyer sends you information, they're not trying to grab the email mid send, they're, they're accessing your computer where your computer is now already decrypting the encrypted file. So, you will see a lot of times, especially with lawyers, sometimes with accountants. Yeah, I can see that in chat there. Um, they use a third party portal where they will give you information saying, hey, your password will be a combination of the, these key pieces of information that only you will know. Follow this link and then there you can download it. So that way they're not sending you core information straight to your email where it could potentially be um, seen and decrypted from other people, but they're giving a third party secure site that you both have access to and without your security checks in place, you won't see it. But for the most part, every email system does have encryption built into it before you send and receive emails. That's great. Perfect. I think this is where we are going to wrap up. It is one o'clock on the dot. Thank you so much, Kathy. That was wonderful. Um, as you said, it's all great information. We don't want to scare anyone, but we do want you to be aware um, and to be careful. So I hope this gave you some awareness and helped you to be careful within your own businesses and your personal life. And I think that's where we will wrap up. Thank you very much for joining. Um, and again, thank you very much, Kathy. This was, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joanne, for hosting today. All right. Thank you, everyone. We will hopefully see you at another Lunch and Learn in the future.